Hi. We're uh, getting a late start, so um, and I was just running up and down the stairs to get the presentation. So if I'm out of breath, I apologize. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Nick Kozlowski. I'm a, a senior technical advisor with First Key Consulting. Um, we're a full service beverage consulting or mostly beer uh, consulting company. Uh, we've been in, around for over 35 years. Uh, we've done projects in in 50 countries, and uh, we work with the largest breweries in the world to, to the smallest. Um, so we're really a, a full service firm. Today, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, beverage diversification and, and brewery ops for the future. Um, I know this is like a like an ops kind of um, train that we're on today, but it's a little bit more of a technical talk. Um, and uh, anyway, I, I don't know whether or not, because we're already kind of short on time, if we wanna do like Q and A's as they pop up, if you guys have like pressing, questions because there's a lot of slides to get through um by all means throw up your hand and i'll do my best to answer your question so so um with rapidly changing consumer demands uh, we're seeing people choose beverages other than just traditional beer and craft beer um, my my whole background is, is really craft beer before i got into consulting but we're we're seeing more and more that that consumers are are opting for different different products than kind of your traditional craft beer. Um, so hard seltzers, distilled beverages, malt beverages. We're not going to talk about distilled or malt today. Um, we're really going to focus on hard seltzers, low alcoholic beer, and non alcoholic beer. Um, they're all growing really rapidly. We see more of, and more of them on the shelves all the time. Um, and if you want to produce them as a craft brewer, what does it mean for you? What do you actually need? What equipment in your existing facility can be used to accommodate that production need? And what is really going to be kind of stress tested inside your four walls if uh, you decide that you, you want to jump into that, that RTD or low elk or non-elk beer space? Excuse me. So... Um, like I said, uh, we'll look at the technical considerations of, uh, of RTDs, de-elk beer, uh, alcohol-free beer, uh, the really the utilities that are needed to produce them. And uh, you, you might be surprised at some of the, the numbers that you see when it, when it comes time to deciding that you want to produce these yourselves. And um, the whole other really big part of this is the issue around compliance and safety. Um, we're no longer dealing with just the regular four ingredients usually four ingredients that we see in beer. Um, as soon as we start to talk about high proof spirits um, or, or high alcohol containing ingredients in the production space, um, the requirements really, really change pretty drastically. And uh, you're no longer just uh, kind of running from space to space, milling grain and not, not really worrying about, um, about the ingredients that you're handling. There's some big considerations. So um, like I said, it's mostly, this is a, a technical talk. Um, and it doesn't cover the financial feasibility of actually deciding um, if you want to just start to produce RTDs or low elk or non-elk beers. I will give you an idea of some of the costs um, for kind of like what we consider like the high tier, mid to high tier technologies that you can use to actually produce them. Um, and I realize that for a lot of people in the room, it's just, it's totally cost prohibitive. Uh, but I want to give you guys an idea of, of kind of like what it, what it takes, right? So we'll look at that today. So um, what is an RTD or ready to drink beverage? Um, I mean, they're, they're typically spirit-based seltzers and, and premixed premix cocktails. Um, water uh, and, and alcohol, the alcohol could be neutral grain spirit. Maybe it's some kind of boutique spirit um, that you've acquired from your, your local friendly distiller. And then uh, flavors, which could be either liquid or powder-based, which get dissolved and then added back into that, that liquid stream. Um, they're not huge uh, in terms of the market share. So I only have figures for the, the U.S. market uh, for all retail alcohol sales. It's like two and a half percent really in the U.S. Um, but what we're seeing is really rapid growth, at least in the most recent 52-week sales period from IRI, which is a uh, data analytics and research company. Um, they're showing up 40% year over year um, as opposed to 0.8% for all alcohol. So it's definitely a, a fast growing segment of uh, the alcohol industry. And it kind of goes in line with the resurgence of lower carb beers that we're seeing. And the, and this whole idea that, um, you know, products that don't contain as much sugar 
uh, or as or as many carbs are are better for you, which is in line with a lot of the trends that we're seeing for most millennial consumers. Um, they're drinking less beer and they're opting for things that are you, well, actually they're drinking less alcohol, uh, but certainly less beer and un- opting for things that are that are slightly uh, healthier. <laughs> um, one kind of interesting fact that I came across too when looking at some of these industry numbers, which I, I typically don't, I just stick to the technical side, was that two out of ten RTDs actually um, launched in North America last year carried a, a craft claim that was associated with them. So it kind of begs the question of these producers that are producing um, RTDs and, and, and calling them craft uh, for a segment that's typically been reserved for craft beer consumers. Uh, does that mean that like maybe there's a risk um, that some of that market share is gonna, for, you know, normally reserved for craft brewers is going to end up um, in RTD producers? Well, I, I don't know. I guess we'll see. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about low alk and dealkalized beer. Um, very common and, and really popular in Europe for the last number of years. Um, I can remember being in brewing school 11 years ago, and they were talking about low alk beers. <laughs> so what the hell is that? <laughs> Who drinks those? But they're becoming more and more common. Um, low alcohol being anything under 0.5% and, uh, and, and non-alcoholic beers being anything uh, 0.05% or lower. So basically, no, no completely non-alcoholic very small market share, 0.5% of the total North American market. But again, last year's trends show that um, beer was up 19.5% uh, in North America, while North American craft beer was up 288%. Obviously, statistics and numbers don't mean a whole lot unless you have the whole story, especially if we have, we're talking about a very small market that if you have a few new entrants and people that decide that they want to start producing, all of a sudden the number you know triples um, because it's such a small volume right now. It's such a small proportion of the, of the total market, but it at least shows that there's growth in this space. Um, and we see examples on the shelf too, right? Um, here I've got Iota, you know, Heineken, Partake. These are all like pretty common brands that we're seeing and, and becoming more and more familiar with. And I'm, anybody who's been to a party lately has probably seen somebody who's drinking a, either a low elk or a non-alcoholic beer, um, the kind of like the most bullish pundits that I came across are all predicting like 30 to 50% growth in the next uh, three years. I'm not a marketer. I can't validate those claims. Um, and these are obviously people who also want to push the product. Um, but, you know, given the fact that it's easier to sell a non-alcoholic product on a grocery store shelf, on any kind of retail space, um, as opposed to a more highly regulated alcohol um space is is kind of shows that the the barriers to entry are a lot easier for these these low alk and non-alcoholic products non-alk that's yeah, non-alk yep yeah. sorry i'm breathing into the mic um so uh, I guess like for most people that are that are producing RTDs, maybe you have or maybe you haven't, I don't I don't know. Um, but you know, most craft breweries that decide that they want to produce an RTD um and and want to get into that market with minimal investment in technology and equipment, uh, how are they doing it? Especially using traditional craft brewing equipment. So I mean the common approach is is boiling like a non-alcoholic ingredient um in the kettle, usually sugar-based, uh, then cooling and casting to a fermenter. Diluting again with additional water and the addition of either alcohol and flavors occurs either in, in the fermenter or the bright tank. Um, and then it's carbonated and packaged. And over the last few years of doing, and we've done a, a number of RTD projects for um, clients of, of all sizes, we've seen some drawbacks to the method. Um, the three most common are, are either incomplete tank mixing or actual stratification in the tank uh, in the vessel during like pre-packaging or even during packaging. Um, big long cooling periods in the BBT. So once you actually mix up your batch and put it into BBT, it takes a while for it to actually get down cold enough where you can carbonate it and package it. Or just overall inconsistent product specs. Um, and uh, especially if you want to be a, like a, a contract producer or you want to make small batches, uh, you know, when we're talking about errors in flavor or the alcohol addition, you know, we don't have a huge margin in, um, in BC or Canada to, uh, when it comes to alcohol. So errors in metering those things into that, that product stream can, can really like, you can get in a lot of shit. Um, so it's important that, that all of those ingredients that are, that are being added are, are done. So at the right proportions, probably one of the easiest ways, um, it, it, you know, to prevent stratification is just with a side mount agitator. Um, it's, it's usually used to maintain homogeneity in the product during your batch production, um, during a packaging run. And you can either specify these in your tank when you're buying a new tank, 
um, or you can add them to your existing vessel. That's that's pretty common too. You just <laughs> as long as you're not cutting into your glycol jacket, um, they can be added if you kind of want to repurpose a uh, a bright tank to what's kind of you know commonly known as like a, a batch tank or a mixed tank. And then in order to avoid um, really long bright tank residency times, which is again, is one of these common errors that we're seeing, um, it's just by use of an external trim chiller. So if you use an external trim chiller and a pinpoint carbonator, you can really, really quickly cool down the vessel um, and the liquid in that vessel to the right temperature so that you can, you can carbonate it. Um, if you're going vessel to vessel, maybe you can do this in a single pass um, without actually having to wait for the whole thing to cool down. It's just a very big glycol load. Um, but this is kind of like the, the common arrangement too, where you're recirculating outside of the vessel through a heat exchanger, then back in. Once that temperature gets to the right point, you can start to carbonate. So, and again, that big, that, the reason it works is because there's that big Delta T, right? Um, when you're talking about trying to just use the jackets in a, in a bright tank, we all know that we can't, you can't really count on a bright tank or a mixed tank to do a whole load of cooling for you, right? It, it's really the a heat exchanger is, is, is the best way to do it. So when that shorter tank residency time also means that you have more theoretical batches per week, per month, per year. Um, if you can get that liquid into the tank, cool it, carbonate it, get it emptied and get the next batch in as quickly as you can. So it has a pretty big impact on overall capacity when um, you're talking about faster tank turnover. Uh, arguably the most impactful ingredient in the RTD um, batch process is, is the how much alcohol you're adding. Uh, again, just that being that you can get in trouble <laughs> for that. Uh, it, you know, you can anger your, your, your customers if your flavors aren't the same all, all the time, but you can actually get in trouble with the tax man if, uh, if the alcohol is wrong. So using the appropriate instrumentation to actually measure the volume dosed into a tank is, is definitely industry best practice. Um, in this case, we're showing an alcohol buffer tank. Oh, we're not. Uh, an alcohol buffer tank uh, that's be being metered downstream using a combination of both a VFD controlled pump and a, and a pressure transmitter with a mass, uh, mass flow meter. And then obviously you can't um, just buy these things. You also have to have the brains to, to, to run the PLC. And that could mean either like a, or to run the, uh, the mass flow meter and, and control system that's metering. So that can mean either a dedicated PLC, like a microcontroller or bringing it into your, your broader system controls. Um, and if a mass flow meter and and really those proper controls are cost prohibitive, uh, you can always use a mag flow meter. It's not quite as accurate, but it's still going to be better than, uh, you know, it seems about right. <laughs> or, uh, or using a sight glass. Um, a measurement Canada approved scale can also be used to add the appropriate volume of alcohol by weight. Um, it's a super cost effective way to, to meter what is, again, the most tightly uh, controlled ingredient in your RTD batch process. Um, and inconsistency can be even more of an issue if you're producing for someone else under contract, uh, um, or you have an uncontrolled effect on the, on the cost of goods sold. So it's not just, are you being consistent for yourself? It's if you're producing for somebody else, um, what impact does that have? What kind of agreement do you have with your, uh, you know, with your customer to, to actually produce to a certain spec? So if we kind of like shift gears and go towards producing without that traditional brew house, and I'm, I'm sure, sure a bunch of you are thinking, well, that's not how we do it, or we've seen other places that do it differently. This, th these are not the only ways that it's done. These aren't the only common problems. Um, these are just some examples that I've, I've seen in the last number of years. Um, but if you decide that you want to go kind of your more dedicated RTD production um, system without using a brew house, what does it mean? And what, and what are a couple of examples? So I'll share two. Um, both are, are pretty capital intensive, but provide arguably the best results for the most consistent product. So the first is, like a, is, a, is a mostly automated solution um, that we're the, basically we're producing a single batch of a product that's that's batch to the correct specs before being sent along to packaging. And the second one is basically taking bulk uh, liquid streams and then blending them with the right proportions just upstream of the filler. Um, and both those technologies are, are, are pretty common and, and available today. So here's a recirculation loop for a batch process. So we'll have bulk alcohol, bulk syrup, and DAW or deaerated water. And again, like this, this graphic's not showing like 
valves or pumps or heat exchangers or instrumentation, all the things that actually go along with making it work. It's really just a flow diagram. But we can see bulk alcohol is coming into the system. Um, it's being cut with deaerated water, uh, which is also kind of uh, can flush that bulk syrup line and that deaerated, well, the deaerated water line is <laughs> it's not flushing itself. Um, and being brought into, if we follow that blue line down into that kind of batch research line. The burgundy line that's just shooting down from that manual ingredient dumping station is showing that main kind of recirc loop. So over time, uh, an operator can actually add manual ingredients um, into a vessel, a dedicated vessel that's used for, again, adding either alcohol containing ingredients or, um, or powder based ingredients, getting them homogenized, uh, usually with a high shear agitator and then being dosed into that research line. That research line is injected kind of like from that slide that we saw before with that external heat exchanger and um, pinpoint carbonator. Same kind of premise is used here, where once we get that research line and loop turned around enough times and we've added all the ingredients and we have homogeneity in the tank and we can verify specifications, we can take that path off to the filler. So it's basically just a it's, it's, it's a big recirculating tank and loop system where you can you can dose in ingredients as needed. Um, this adds a whole lot of flexibility. Um, basically, it means that you can you can dose the right ingredient at the right time manually, right? So um, you could be pretty specific in how much you're, you're adding and weighing. You rely a little bit less on instrumentation than you do for, you know, counting on everything being, being metered in with a mass flow meter. It provides an operator a check to say yes, um, or quality to say, yes, this meets all the specifications that we're after for pH, for alcohol, for everything else. Um, and it also makes sure that some of the powdered or liquid ingredients that otherwise wouldn't be compatible together are added at their dedicated times and separately from each other, right? So um, um, again, some ingredients don't play well together, um, sorbates and I think it's acids that need to be added at, you know, at separate times. So this allows you to do that without kind of running any kind of health risks or, or, or material handling risks. And um, yeah, like I said, once that product spec is met um, during that continuous recirculation, it can be sent to the filler. Um, most of the systems that we've engineered and installed have, it's usually about a six to an eight hour kind of time to, to, to make a, up a batch. Uh, but again, that can vary hugely depending on the complexity. Um, and just like we have this manual ingredient dumping, maybe it's not manual ingredients dumping, maybe it's a tote of uh, tequila um, that you're using to make up your specialty cocktail or, or whatever it is, like any kind of like non-beer RTD beverage that you're adding. Um, this this kind of dedicated dumping tank is, 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 is super useful, uh, really. Uh, that the kind of more highly automated uh, option that doesn't include uh, an external um, batch system and, and continuous recirculation system is really using bulk alcohol that's cut down to 20%. I can all talk more about why it's cut down to 20%. Um, syrup, your deaerated water, and then your flavor base. It could be that your flavor base is made up in a, in a way that was similar to that last slide that was showing a continuous batch system. And maybe you're just making up a flavor base, right? And, um, and, and eventually that's getting fed into um, the downstream, but um, but really, what what this unit's doing in this case, it's a it's a it's a Conti flow by Crohn's. Um, if you guys ever get the opportunity, you should take a look at them because they're pretty cool. Uh, but they'll take. Nice. I. Uh... I sourced the image, so don't get me in trouble. Okay, okay, good, yeah. So, but basically, yeah, you can take a, you can take a blend of a variety of different product streams uh, at the correct proportions at, as feedstock, really, um, send them into this machine and it'll be blended to the right proportions as per the recipe uh, and then sent downstream to the filler. Um, it's pretty slick. It's not like craft beer brewing, right? These are like, a, <laughs> this is not craft beer brewing. Um, but it exists, uh, and, um, and and anyway, it, it takes a, a whole lot of guesswork out of, um, you know, maybe your more traditional RTD batching methods if you're producing using a traditional uh, brew house. So um, it's kind of like a carbo blend. This, this can also be used to adjust carbonation, um, or maybe there's a nitrogen option if you want to make a, a still product. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, too. Um, or, and you can basically fully carbonate the product in line. Um, so you also get a little bit of partial deaeration with, with product water. I don't know that a sales rep will be able to tell you what option that it is. I know that it can do that. Um, um, but, uh, but basically, that's it. So instead of making a, like a batch process that we carbonate, 
we find the right specs and then we send to the filler, um, probably through a buffer tank first. Um, this is basically doing all the blending in line en route to the filler. So regardless of your approach to production, um, be it kind of like that first traditional using your crop brew house or doing a, a recirculation loop as a batch system or doing kind of bulk blending in line. Uh, all these RTD projects really are their water projects. And, um, and it's because the right utilities have to be in place to service all the equipment. So for some crop breweries, deaerated water is either like a luxury or it's completely non-existent in the cellar. Um, I think a lot of crap in here probably don't have access to deaerated water or don't need it or think they don't need it. Um, I find it hugely useful. But the majority of the clients that we worked with that decide they want to actually pr uh, pursue RTD and other alternative beverages, um, they need pretty substantial upgrades to their deaerated water or DAW systems uh, or an entirely new supplemental system altogether uh, just to produce enough deaerated water to expand into the RTD space that like we saw like, you know, in previous slides, like, you know, the main, really the main liquid stream that's going into these products is deaerated water. Um, and we can talk about more whether or not you actually need deaerated water in, a, in another couple of slides. But uh, to produce deaerated water is energy intensive. Um, and, and it puts huge loads on your utilities. So either your new or existing DAW system, if you decide that you, if you haven't already, you decide you want to start to produce RTDs, it's going to strain that system, um, your water treatment equipment. So anything upstream from what's coming into the building and then downstream and being distributed for process water, uh, your glycol cooling, um, maybe even your steam requirements and certainly your CO2 and, and maybe even electrical needs too. electrical being, uh, you know, especially if you, if you need a new, uh, new glycol chiller. So um, why do you need deaerated water or more specifically, like how is it used? And there's kind of like two main high flow and low for low flow processes. If you're, if you're going to batch up and make some RTD, um, the, the real high volume users uh, are, are really being like dilution and the batch makeup water to produce the product. So that process water that ends up as an ingredient and the low volume users are going to be for ingredient mixing, especially if you're talking about using a, uh, like a powder based ingredient that you're getting, um, basically just, you know, mixed up enough that you can pump it over into that product stream. Again, either being fed into right into a bright tank or a mixed tank or added to that batch recirculation loop or added as a bulk, uh, kind of supply to your, to your Conti flow or whatever other kind of comparable, uh, technologies out there. Um, oh, well, sorry about that. Thanks. Um, but uh, you you might you might have a like a way higher target or not even care about do <laughs> in your product at all, uh, in which case you can ignore the slide. Um, but most large brewers target around two hundred parts per billion in tank before packaging, and you know that it's important for you independently to establish uh, your own quality standards uh, with empirical data, the input from your quality panel, um, and and your own quality specs based on the ingredients that you use and the shelf life that you claim. But, um, you know, this question was asked to me a little while ago and actually I didn't have a number, the number at the time, but yeah, the, what we're seeing is kind of like from the, from the world's global brewers, um, 200 PPP is kind of a typical spec for a non beer derived RTD product. Um, I, I can't validate those claims. Uh, and I think that part of that might be coming from the fact that, you know, really the the largest producers of these products were traditionally brewers and as brewers we know that do matters so much for our product and uh 200 is a very interesting round number um and it you know conveniently it's 10 times more than 20 <laughs> which tends to be kind of like you know the the golden number for for bright tank do so um all i can say is you 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 might be able to produce these products without deaerated water but the best standards in the world currently are that you kind of target around 200 PPP. So, um, so if the typical breed deaerated water uh, that you have that you're using for dilution or um, beer dilution or line packs and pushes um, can be carbonated, what if the product that you're making is still uh, like a canned cocktail or canned wine or some kind of other like still beverage that shouldn't be carbonated? Um, how do you actually produced on that sense. And, and the answer is, is warm deaeration. 
So um, here's an example of a warm dairy uh, daw production process. So we basically have incoming water from the top. Um, that shouldn't say temp, sorry, I had an updated slide. Um, it's actually not temper, it's, it's regen. Um, so the water is moving through two heat exchangers. The second one is where it's being heated with steam, which you can see by the red line, making its way into the top of that column where it cascades down through a, a series of, uh, for those of you who are familiar with a deration, um, column this is kind of the same thing except that there's a, there's heat added to it um so at the same time through the green line we have either nitrogen or co2 that's pumped up cross flow against the water as it cats, cascades down through like a, a really high surface area a number of different stainless steel plates um on its way out again it's kind of getting this temper or or regen section is actually so you can see the incoming water is is picking up a little bit of heat from that secondary um heat exchanger on its way out you end up with about 91 to 92% energy recovery with that step uh, because we're eventually gonna, gonna heat, right? So it's kind of that like tempering process is hugely critical if you wanna make um, um, still deaerated water. And then it's cool to then send along to, to be used later on. If you didn't use uh, a column that's set up like this using, using steam to produce still deaerated water, uh, you can just hammer it so if you kind of like imagine like this whole loop being removed, right? No steam out at all, then you likely wouldn't have this either. Um, you can just like hammer it with with um, nitrogen even instead of CO2 if you don't want to have as big of a load of CO2. And that, that'll give you somewhat still water, but not quite to the same degree and not as effectively as 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 heating it. Um, mm -hmm. The other kind of added bonus to, to heating on route to the column is that you really keep your bio load down. Like keep in mind, this is, these are all systems that need to be CIP'd and they're systems that are using uh, filtered water already. So your risk of biofouling is really, really high if you're in kind of like a warm scenario. Um, so usually it's heated to about 72 C or a little bit warmer just to make sure that you get hot enough that that column doesn't need as many CIPs. And then um, that now still deaerated water is sent off to either your buffer tank or it's produced like on demand, right? As, as you need it. Um, so again, like one kind of con to this system is that you, you need you definitely have way bigger um, heating and cooling loads to, to run the system, uh, especially when you're moving at really, really high flow rates if you want to produce something on demand. Uh, but the pro is that less CO2 is required to actually degas the water, right? Um, call, these columns can be kind of like hungry for CO2. Um, they use quite a bit. But if that water is heated, that gas is, that oxygen is driven off way more readily. Um, so you end up actually using less, less CO2. And you can see typically like it just goes to vent. <clears throat> I'm sure you like, you know, the, all the conversations that we have about sustainability, there might be an opportunity somewhere to collect and purify that, that vent gas, but, but nine and a half times out of 10, that just goes to atmosphere and, uh, and it's lost. So, um, we can see that again, there's obvious loads on the steam glycol and carbon dioxide that have to be considered uh, if you're going to size a system like this. Um, and those calcs, again, become way more crucial if, if, if you want to kind of produce a system that's on demand as to, um, you know, producing deaerated water, then storing it into a vessel, then using it more as like a batch based system as, instead of instead of on demand. So here I did kind of like a quick calc to just to see like, well, like what's kind of a appropriate flow rate and, and, uh, and what is that like for water? If you actually wanted to make deaerated water on demand and like, what does that mean for your chiller sizing? So uh, I looked at Vancouver's tap water and it typically tops out around 15%. Um, the report from 2021 showed a high of like 23 and a half degrees, which I'm guessing was the, the, the height of the heat dome. Um, from last year, anybody who produces a logger with a uh, single pass heat exchanger was probably feeling the pain at that time. Um, but really what it does is that it, it shows the, this table shows the refrigeration requirements. If you want to produce DAW at various flow rates at 15 degrees Celsius and a single pass through a heat exchanger, um, again, most breweries will probably produce store and then use that that dearded water especially if you're just getting into the rtd space like it's not going to demand a huge amount from you you're you maybe doing small batches and deciding whether or not you have a, a good marketing strategy and your product tastes good and you can continue to grow it right so you're not going to jump in with both feet but if you do um it's pretty interesting so so at 30 heck an hour 
if you want to produce it on demand, we're talking about 11 tons of refrigeration or about 131,000 BTUs per hour. And um, I just like came up with a scenario to say like, well, what size brewery is that per year that actually needs a chiller that big? Some of you might correct me. You might say, actually, I'd make 8,000 hex, but it's 8,000 hex a year. So the total chilling load for kind of like your typical ale brewery um, that's not crashing all of its tanks all at once, all at once needs about 11 tons of refrigeration per year. Um kind of peak that's not engineering for any like serious peak loads or system losses or anything like that so it just kind of gives you an idea of how much cooling power is really needed if you want to you know provide this ingredient into your batch system but like on de on demand so um when you start to look at that it kind of changes your perspective on how you might want to integrate something like this into your existing system right or you just bite the bullet buy a new chiller i don't know um so it's important that these calcs are performed for all the breweries utility loads especially like the last one that showed um still water like you want to know what the actual loads are going to be on your co2 on your steam uh obviously on your water filtration side and then and then most certainly on your on your glycol system too so um moving on to compliance and safety yeah maybe like not like the sexiest topics uh but super important for rtds um mostly because of the implications of handling some of these materials per the BC Fire Code. So the BC Fire Code uh, defines distilled beverage alcohol as a beverage that is produced by fermentation contains more than 20% alcohol. So, so what does that mean for RTD ingredients? Well, basically it means that your bulk ethanol unloading or handling, and that might even just be like a tote. I, I don't mean bulk in a big tank that's being cut down. It could be any, it could even be a pail really of alcohol. Um, and your RTD ingredient storage and blending are are all affected by the regulations and the rules um, by the BC Fire Code. So uh, I know definitely that most breweries that are using high proof alcohol ingredients um, aren't necessarily considering the BC Fire Code when they're handling them or storing them. Uh, it's just kind of not the norm. And um, the vast majority of people are just kind of flying under the radar and... Um, but but it's important for you to know that actually technically like it you kind of you could maybe get in trouble right uh, I'm not going to call a fire department on anybody but um, but it does have an impact on your overall brewery uh, equipment and operations and if you decide that you want to actually build a dedicated system that is handling these systems on like pretty regularly um, you know especially where you're where you're talking about major like bulk storage and handling of these ingredients there's there's a few things that you need to be familiar with. So the first thing is area classification. So in the case of either using a uh, like a like a mixed tank that we could talked about in that kind of like batch recirc um, scenario, uh, or a bulk alcohol tote, or again pails for the addition of high proof ingredients, the electrical area classification dictates the types of devices uh, that can be used in that environment, the grounding requirements, and then even the HVAC needs for the space too. So in this example, we've got um, a mixing and batching area and it's treated as hazardous during production. So um, the proper way to actually mitigate the this these hazard zones is a dedicated air system, air handling system that's exhausting um, to the outside, usually providing about 12 air, air changes per hour. And, um, and they're not small zones. So it doesn't matter, you know, the total volume that you're using. If here we have zone two that's extending 25 feet horizontally from the point of use, um, 10 feet radially from the point of use and, uh, and three feet up from floor level. So if you kind of imagine like alcohol vapors being heavy and having the potential to spread that area classification is extending 25 feet from the point of use. So I know that there's, there's a whole lot of flavors out there from flavor houses that are alcohol based and technically they fall into the same category. So zone one, which is like extremely hazardous, um, extends as a three foot radius, um, from from that point of use and uh, and and is considered extremely high risk. And that bubble grows even more depending on where the ingredients are actually being opened, measured, handled, and then and then added to the to the batch too. So it's not just like this is the vessel that's holding them. It's like well, where are you handling them and where are you opening them? Um, and then it ends up it ends up being <laughs> like pretty pretty restrictive. So um, I mentioned HVAC needs before. So here's an example of a, a, a kind of like the, the area classification that we saw from the last slide where we have zone one and then zone two that's extending 25 feet, uh, three feet off the floor and the recommended HVAC system that's providing um, continuous air sweep. So we can see kind of, again, 
alcohol vapors being heavier than air, uh, kind of being pushed towards this side of the wall at the point of use where they're being exhausted of the building by the right type of equipment that's actually spark free and 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 rated for that type of use. So these are um like critical if you're gonna design a space that's gonna be using these these um high proof spirits. It's not even high proof, it's anything over 20%, right? So um, um one thing that's pretty important too is that you know you can excuse me you can you can mitigate some of this like horizontal <laughs> uh challenge by putting in a wall if you put in a wall uh that's you know kind of like right at the barrier here you've now cut off that zone right uh, as long as the wall is tall enough so that area classification can be totally contained it doesn't mean that it's going to extend for 25 feet you know Regardless, um, there are provisions that you can actually do to make sure that it's it's, it's a smaller area classification because there's added costs and uh, and complexity engineering that has to go into you know making sure that anything that's in that zone is is compliant, right? Um, if you're not sure, uh, there's companies out there that can do like fire safety audits that can actually come into your space and say, listen, we've done we've done an audit. We know how much you're handling, how much you're storing. They don't report you either, right? So if you know that you're way out of compliance, that's okay. They, they, they'll come in and they'll give you the kind of like the recommendation for how to mitigate risk and make sure that you get into compliance. So LRI is a company that's pretty common that, that we've worked with, a lot of our clients have, and they're great. Um, and they'll kind of give you a, a solution. Right? So here's two examples of really like properly constructed mixed tanks or towed and loading areas. And really like these are also kind of um, like barrel or drum or pail unloading areas, right? Because the same rules apply regardless of the volume that you're using. Um, and they provide fresh makeup air. Um, they've got hazardous zones contained by brick walls, especially the one on the right that you can see there's brick walls. Um, the image on the left is showing that kind of like dedicated air sweep that's pushing air down and towards over here, which is going to be your your like your exhaust system that's going to be taking away all the alcohol vapors that are collecting at up to three feet above ground level. So, and any instruments that are in the zone are going to be explosion proof rated. They're rated for class one, div one, um, if they're installed properly. Otherwise, you run the risk of of, uh, of a spark um, or worse. Um, and kind of like beyond that proper fire safety audit and the recommendations and having the right space built. Um, it's like electrical engineers should definitely be consulted before you procure and install any devices that are going into the space because they're the ones that can actually provide the area classification based on, on the ingredients that you're using. And it's really important to have a like a, a well-defined material handling and storage plan too. So it's not just a matter of um, I'm going to take the ingredients from my warehouse and they're closed and I'm going to transport them over here and then open up and use them. There needs to be an actual plan that's in place that, that, that you can show somebody that says like, listen, we've done everything that we can to mit mitigate risk. Um, and I'm not even going to get into storage. That's kind of like it's whole other topic because there's, there's a whole bunch of rules and regulations about uh, fire suppression in those areas. And I mean, like when I say fire suppression, I mean like actual, like, um, sprinklers inside of racks. Like it's kind of, it becomes a whole other kettle of fish if you decide that you want to store a lot of whole like bulk ingredients that are flammable on site. Um, and not shown here um, or in any of the other slides are just our, our, our LEL detect detectors or lower explosive limit detectors, um, which kind of similar to like a seller CO2 monitor. Um, they provide an audible and a visual alarm in the event of excessive vapor collection. So um, they're, they're pretty commonly tied to like building ex exhaust systems or even interlocks to the equipment so that if there's a, a higher threshold than what's allowed to be detected, the equipment just won't turn on, like it just won't let it. So um, that's used in a lot of distilleries too, where if, if you have like a, you know, a kind of a confined space and you don't want to actually be able to turn your still on unless the exhaust fan is running and the LEL is, is not registering a level that's beyond what's acceptable. So kind of changing gears from RTDs, you guys are all like, oh my God, I'm just thinking about all the places that I'm storing high proof booze. I'm going to get in so much trouble. Um, it's just important to think about, right? So um, especially if, again, if you want to scale that RTD production. So I'll, I'll move. Um, into low alk and, and dealkalized beer. Um, we did a high level analysis for like a like a, a regional brewery in the US that was looking at their technological options when it came to and, and high level costing 
uh, when it came to producing either low alcohol or dealkalized beer uh, using a skid mounted system. Obviously, there's different ways that you can. I'm uh, sorry, this is not the. Um, there's a couple of words that are missing, but it, it's not the only way that you can produce low alcohol beer. I mean, there's either arrested fermentation, you could do cold contact method, um, you could use, um, you know, like non maltose yeast like Ludwigi and other ways. There's there's other ways that you can produce low alcohol beer, uh, but at least this this client in particular was looking at more of a skid based system that um, that didn't require any kind of the challenges that were associated with the the other methods. The main reason being that they didn't have a pasteurizer, right? And it, you know it's pretty common that if you have a, an arrested fermentation or other kind of al alternative way of producing a low alcohol beer, you usually end up with quite a bit of residual sugar that's that's potentially a higher risk. So that needs to be pasteurized. They didn't want to put in a pasteurizer. So, um, so, so what we did is we, we looked at a couple, well, a couple solutions for them. Um, and again, there's a lot of companies out there that can provide solutions within the industry. Uh, but this facility in question already had a bunch of alpha Laval different skid based solutions, and they were kind of chosen as the, as the preferred vendor, um, for, for the solution, just because of the ease of integration. And it kind of gets interesting too, like you might have, um, and well, I'll talk more about costs later on, but like integration costs end up being, you know, a little bit more than you, than you think they might as opposed to just buying the unit up front. So sometimes sticking with the same brand uh, makes a lot of sense. Just ask the Crohn's guy. Um, <laughs> so at least in this scenario, this like this low alcohol beer pr pr skid that's capable of producing low alcohol beer, uh, which is creatively named Low Al, uh, is a, is a, it's a batch system and it uses cross flow membrane tech. It's something that we're seeing more and more commonly in in the craft beer space is cross flow filters, cross flow membrane filters weren't really used very much before, but they're gaining more and more popularity as they, they you know. Um, they become easier to use and the cost is dropping. Um, but basically what this does is it, is it uses membrane technology to produce concentrated beer by removing alcohol and water from the feedstock. So while a batch of beer is continuously recirculated um, across these, these membranes uh, and, and redo, re reintroduced back into that tank itself, the volume is actually decreasing while we're pulling out water and, and alcohol. Um, and it's recirculated at really, really high pressure all the low molecular weight compounds like water and alcohol are taken out of the liquid stream. Um, and that those high molecular weight compounds like that are containing like proteins and color and, and other flavor compounds, they all get concentrated into a uh, retentate, right? So they're retained. Um, that retentate is diluted to the appropriate ABV uh, again, by using de-aerated water um, to make up the final low alk volume. So, and then you can actually like, you can actually fine tune um, the flavor uh, by introducing CO2 or flavor um, or coloring to reach the desired specs. And a lot of you guys are probably like, what? <laughs> it's not craft beer. And it's not really. Um, it's Again, this is like alternative beverages, right? So um, RTD, low alk and de-alk beer. Um, so, but if you want to extend the actual life of the membrane, it's really important that you feed it um, really low solids containing beer. So that's something that's either been filtered really, really bright, like using DE or again, a, a different cross flow filter. Um, and in this situation at, you know, five heck an hour, um, that, 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 that permeates not recovered. Um, that just, that goes to drain. So that's that water and that alcohol. It's not, it's not, there's a, there's no use to that anymore. So at the end of the day, you just started off with X number of liters of beer. You recirculated externally across the membranes it pulled out the water and the alcohol. You're left with a lower concentration of liquid, which you then dilute with the aerated water and meet your target specs that you're after. So again, this is like a, a skid mounted system. Any issues with dumping it down the drain? Um, yeah, you know, I don't actually have any specs on on what that um, what that makeup is. It's it's mostly water and alcohol, um, but I'm not sure of the pH or anything else. But I can try to get you the answers. So again, here's the flow diagram, just kind of showing the process. Um, at least in this scenario where we show plate and frame, like that could be anything. It could be uh, whatever technology you want to use to actually produce bright beer. Um, and then uh, step two is showing bright beer. It, it's not necessarily a bright tank. It's kind of more like a batch tank or, or it, it, you wouldn't want to use a bright tank for this just because of how long the residency is that's required during that continuous recirculation until that alcohol is removed um, enough. 
Well, this one in particular produces five hex an hour. So, um, and I'll, I'll get to costing and everything for that too, but you can kind of see, so you're feeding it water glycol, hot and cold water, air to actually run all the valves. Um, and then that, that permeate that we don't want that's rejected just goes to drain. Um, and then that kind of low, lower alcohol, bright beer that's under 0.5%. Um, again, like here, I'm showing carboblend and flexitherm and other couple skid-based systems. You don't necessarily need to do that. You might just dilute to the right concentration and then, and then send it to the filler, um, either in the bright tank or kind of in another tank in between. So that's, that's kind of one batch process um, that's using skid-based membrane filtration technology to reduce alcohol content to make a low alcohol beer. So um, if you want to make dealkalized beer, the last one provides anything like under 0.5%. So if you want to get to that under 0.05%, uh, it's a little bit it's a little bit different tech. Um, it's typically, and really the only way that I know is with, is with like vapor stripping. So it's basically vacuum distillation. Um, and, and it's more, it's continuous. Um, actually it's, it's not a batch pro uh, process. It's, it's continuous. So, um, so we'll actually use, um, instead of concentrating that beer again via filtration and then adding water back to the concentrated retentate, you strip out the alcohol uh, with a column um, of deaerated RO treated water. So again, we're talking about another whole utility that we need to add if you don't have RO available in your facility. Um, and then that's condensed, captured, and then after vacuum treatment uh, to remove all the non-condensable volatiles. Right, So all your aromatic compounds and, and anything else that's volatile actually gets taken right out. Those aromatic compounds are actually captured and then can be dosed back into the product stream to the required specification. So all of those beery smells and aromas uh, are removed and then you can actually add them back in at the right proportion. So that condensed alcohol and water solution, which is now about 20% alcohol, um, that you've that you re you've removed in that previous system that went to drain in this scenario it's actually recovered um and it can be used in other beverage products so you end up with what is essentially a, a seltzer base uh 20 percent alcohol seltzer base that you that you can use for for other product streams so there's um there's some real added flexibility to this but there's also more complexity too um the first thing being that you know well, I guess one of the, the real pros is that like this can make also produce a beer that's 0.5%. So it's technically low alcohol. It can either be more than 0.5 too, right? You can remove as much alcohol as you want. Um, but in order to actually capture that 20% alcohol that would typically be rejected, um, you need a distiller's license. And all that material that you're using that's been collected at 20% ABV also falls under the same guidelines uh, for the BC Fire Code. Um, just like handling any anything else that's twenty percent or over, so um, there's definite more there's there's more challenges that go along with it. Um, furthermore, there's also um, some additional engineering and, and utility needs that go into producing a, or running a system like that. So again, just a, another kind of flow diagram showing uh, unfiltered beer. Uh, you really want to feed this stuff uh, beer that's as bright as possible. Um, here we're showing a centrifuge to a buffer tank, going through that de-elk uh, vapor stripping module, which instead of a batch process that's recirculated through the tank is in line. Um, you're getting 20% ABV as, as a side stream, and then you're getting bright beer at 0.05% alcohol later on, right? And um, and actually, I'm not sure whether or not the flavor, like those aromatics are added back in at the module or downstream. I'm not entirely sure. So if somebody knows, I'd, by all means, please let me, um, let me know. But so there's the, the kind of the real difference. And the one that we're showing here is, you know, rated for, uh, for 10 heck an hour. So uh, craft, I'm a craft brewer. I want to get into the RTD space. I want the I want the slickest tech that money can buy. All my utilities have been sized properly. I've done flow diagrams. I know that I can service these things. How much does it cost? So these tables are like they're high order project cost estimates that we did uh, from 2021. So uh, the numbers have changed a little bit since then, and uh, they're all in USD. So um, watching everybody's eyeballs get bigger and bigger by the second. So um, again, like the direct costs that are associated with the actual engineering to implement that DELC system are a little bit bigger. There's more stuff going on on the DELC uh, system than there is on the that low wall equipment. Again, those are those are trade names. Um, but um, 
but it's not cheap, right? So for the low wall equipment, it was about 500 to 600,000 USD. Uh, again, that's a five heck an hour. Uh, while the DLX system that had twice the throughput uh, and a more demanding mechanical installation topped out at around 900,000 USD. So um, we're, you know, in that kind of 1.3 Canadian range for 10 heck an hour for dealkalized beer. So I don't have any solutions uh, or any tables that are that are comparing these solutions to other equipment providers in this presentation, um, but there are numerous other options available. I, I just kind of went for the what I think maybe some of us might consider sticker shock in the craft scene. Um, I know for uh, actually somebody just told me yesterday that the DME actually has a solution uh, that's available and it's uh, it's called the Elixir. And if at the end of this session, if anybody has any info about it, or if they have it, I'd love to hear more about it. But I know that it's it's out there and it's an option and it's it's really a fraction of the cost. Um, and that's again a membrane filtration technology. So that'd be for producing low alcohol beer, not not dealkalized beer. Um, so and like really what we're seeing is that you know there's successful products out there using all the different methods, whether it's arrested fermentation, cold contact, um, you know, alternative yeast strains, uh, membrane technology, vapor stripping technology. There's all these different ways to skin the cat. I have a cat. I hate saying that. Um, but there's, but it really, it boils down to like your project, you know, like your project budget, um, the type of product that you want to make. Uh, and basically like through internally processing your, your, like, through an internal process map, making sure that you can understand the impact of implementation uh, for these projects while staying compliant with all the rules and regs is really kind of the most important thing that you can do. So um, I know I've covered a, a few different options, but really at the end of the day, it's going to be what works best for you, right? So, so I guess in conclusion, um, when it, when it comes to talk about you know alternative beverages in the craft beer industry, and you know I cut my teeth in craft, and craft beer is like forever going to be um, the the thing for me. But it's also important to understand the you know where the market's going and the opportunities that might lay out that might exist out there for you as a craft brewer. Um, you know, if you want to get break into that RTD segment, it's it's really important for you to understand the operational limitations, the the utility limitations, maybe even the scheduling limitations that you have in your tank. Maybe you're already at capacity producing just beer. Like it doesn't maybe it doesn't make sense for you to get into this space, right? It's a whole other marketing initiative and all these other regulatory hurdles that you need to jump through, uh, and maybe it doesn't make space for you. Or you've got a great business case for it, and uh, you absolutely want to get into it. So it's just it's important to kind of un to understand the the impact that it's going to make on your business if you decide you want to jump into this space. Um, again, there's a lot of ways to do it. It doesn't all have to be automated skid-based solutions or uh, inline dilution instrumentation that are requiring, you know, uh, process integration specialists and a lot of engineering efforts. Maybe you just kind of want to do it the best that you can with what you have. I mean, that's what, what we do as craft brewers that we're, we're so good at, right? Is, is kind of uh, making the most of what we have available in our, our existing kind of arsenal and toolbox. Um, and that's a way that you can do it too. Just understand the risks that are associated with it, especially when it comes to both ABV uh, in your final product and then also, um, you know, the regulatory requirements when you when you make your product. And then also understand that it's going to probably be a huge strain on your deaerated water um, or you're going to actually need to consider installing a deaerated water system at your brewery. And what does that mean for the rest of your utilities, right? Maybe your water line isn't big enough. I don't know. Um, so are these alternatives to tr traditional craft beer for the future? I don't know. It depends who you ask. I'm not a marketer. I'm not going to pretend to be. Um, I don't know whether or not this is going to be financially feasible or viable for your own business, but, um, but we can see from the numbers that it's a growing space. And, um, and there's definitely ongoing consolidation and investment in, in the industry um, still today. And, and very recently, you just have to read the news to see how uh, this kind of RTD space and low alk and non alk beers are, are gaining more and more popularity all the time. So um, with that, I'll open a QA. and a uh, I've got a colleague in the room who can help me too uh, if I can't answer any of your questions. And I know we're a little, already a little bit over. So um, if you guys have any, by all means, throw your hand up. 